So, questions? Uh, thanks very much. Malcolm Smart from DFID. Uh, thanks very much for four really fascinating presentations. Uh, I've got three very quick questions. The first one, I guess, is probably to Alison, which is, did your wedges take account of climate impacts? Uh, so maybe this is also a question for James. Your middle one, the, the option that you seem to be going for on the power sector, seemed to imply more hydro than the 42% uh, the reduction one. Uh, Question for Alison on the energy. Did your energy efficiency projections take into account rebound effects? Uh, and the f final question is uh, probably for James and Yogesh. Why a tax rather than a trading system? Can we answer the three questions and then uh, we'll carry on since we have three? Okay. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, maybe I start with the last one first. And, and um, I mean, I'm certainly an outsider to the process. So for me to talk about cap and trade versus a carbon tax is, is may perhaps inappropriate. But, but at least um, uh, from my perspective, I mean, it's the same kind of reason for imposing the tax on the fossil fuels that go into the system rather than try to impose them on the emissions that actually come out of industries, because it's a whole lot easier. Um, I think there have, at least in some of the meetings that, that, that I've sat in, there has been a call for a cap-and-trade system from, from some of the business interests. And, and to some extent, uh, starting with a carbon tax doesn't preclude moving to a cap-and-trade system in the future. Um, but holding out for a cap-and-trade system may delay, delay the entire process. And so that would be one reason. Start simple and, and complicate later. Um, I can't actually comment on, the, on why there is more hydropower in the, um, in the policy-adjusted middle road scenario. Um, but, um, but the hydropower that is in there is imported. Um, yeah. Okay, the question wasn't about the hydropower per se. Malcolm, so sorry. Uh, you have to use the microphone, otherwise they... So the question wasn't around the hydropower per se. It was whether climate impact had been taken into account ah. to know whether the hydro, how credible the hydropower was or how credible any of the renewable energy is given, uh, given the impacts of climate change. Uh, well, the, the answer is no. But the good news is that um, this is exactly what we're working on right now. So we are now working the Treasury phase two of this is to actually, at the moment, South Africa has a cap on how much electricity can be imported. And that really puts a constraint on how much of these regional options that Yogesh was talking about um, can actually be harnessed and taken advantage of. So we're thinking about big, big dams like Inga in the Congo, which could supply a lot of South Africa's electricity in the future at a very clean, low emission rate. Um, we're looking at exactly that, looking at um, the, uh, the Adam right there is, is working on it as well, uh, looking at what are the climate risks associated with a hydro-based system. And Adam's also looking at the climate risks associated with a South African-based solar and, and wind-powered system. So on both sides of the system. Hi. Um, yeah. So responding to your did we take uh, the impact of climate change into account? No, we didn't. But I think kind of more worrying for us was that we also didn't take into account um, what the cost of mitigation options might, um, how that might impact the economy. And, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're working with WIDA now to kind of link our, our um, optimization model to their CGE model and, and see, see if, if that can improve our research. And then in terms of energy efficiency, and I think your question was about rebound effects. Uh, we didn't at the time, but we've given it quite a lot of thought since then. Um, and we've had a couple of studies out through ERC on rebound in low-income households in South Africa. So we've, we haven't yet included it in the model, but I think that's something that you know would be interesting to look at in the future. I think at the time, they're simply just... We've had a bit of a... I mean, the, the data issue is one thing, but also in South Africa, there's been... Um, almost a, a total lack of research into um, things like rebound and um, elasticities of consumption to income in the past sort of decade, decade and a half. And I think we have a lot of work to do to fill that gap so that we can begin to include these kind of interesting things in the, in the work that we do. Um. For, yeah, I mean, just, just adding on the cap and trade, um, in addition to the reason that uh, James outlined, we feel that we don't have enough firms in the domestic market to have a 
competitive uh, cap and trade on a domestic level. So unless there is a global market, it is difficult for us to participate. Next set of questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wisdom Akpalu uh, from the State University of New York, uh, but I'm a Ghanaian. Uh, when it comes to disbursing uh, tax revenues, uh, sometimes uh, it comes at a cost. Uh, in most cases, there could be leakages and rent-seeking behavior, uh, which indicates that the estimates that you have there could be, uh, I mean, an overestimate for the growth potentials that you indicated. And I say this because uh, it, there is evidence that, for example, gasoline subsidies tend to be regressive. They favor the rich more than the poor because the rich spend more on gasoline in proportion wise than the poor. But any attempt to remove gasoline subsidies and rechannel the proceeds to social programs uh, is met with uh, fierce resistance, like what happens it happened in Nigeria, because people are not sure that the proceeds will, set, will be used for those programs that are, uh, are indicated. So I think those estimates could be uh, overestimates, although they are supposed to be reductions. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Questions? Uh, I'm Sudhakar Reddy from the Indira Gandhi Institute, uh, Bombay. Uh, question to Alison. Uh, you have not uh, mentioned uh, about energy intensities. And regarding emission intensity, as far as I know, uh, India's emission intensity is significantly higher than OECD, and it is almost equal to Chinese, because I work in this area. But according to you, it is uh, significantly low when compared to OECD countries. I don't think uh, kindly check. And uh, one question to James. He had mentioned uh, um, <coughs> energy efficiency. And the variables are, uh, you have mentioned the price, okay, energy existing technologies. But what about the output prices? And finally, one small lesson regarding scenarios. If you look at uh, scenarios, particularly uh, 1965 EASA model, and they have predicted uh, energy scenarios up to 2030, and you might have seen what had happened after 1973. You can check those figures. There are what, whatever they have predicted and whatever the existing consumption. So baseline scenarios, whatever we predict about baseline scenarios, and if you look at the past uh, scenarios, there are significant differences. So one should be careful about. Uh, it's not business as usual. It never be. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Philip Adams uh, uh, from uh, Australia. Um, uh, uh, really a question, I think, uh, to James, but I'll start off um, um, with the excitement expressed about biomass. It's probably the most excitement I've ever heard um, about biomass. So it raises the question for James in his modelling um, how abatement possibilities from reduced use of biomass or, or however uh, were um, modelled, and as a, a follow-up question, um, how uh, abatement from non-combustion sources more generally uh, were, uh, were handled in uh, his modelling? Thank you. Jose Oliveira, UNUIS. Uh, my question is, is more when you made the calculations, did you include the social costs? Like, for instance, coal has a lot of externalities, both economic, both particularly in health, if uh, these were included in your models. And the second, when you calculate the emissions, if you, it's just the production of electricity, but also the other costs, production of coal. I know there are a lot of problems in South African coal. Metan in, in there are, uh, I visited in Gauteng when there are a lot of mines are just burning and creating a lot of problems in water and particularly in climate. If those, the production of coal, the emissions were included. Uh, and also, uh, you mentioned the cap and trade. Why not, you f instead of thinking only electricity, why not worldwide taxes in carbon generally, including transportation and others? And, uh, and then it could lead to different. Uh, outcome soon. Uh, 
I don't think they were all for me, actually. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> don't even think about that. Um, the, uh, uh, I need to just try and remember the recycling question. But um, on the energy efficiency story, the, um, we do take output prices into account because that's going to determine how attractive a sector is to receive new investment. Remember in the model, uh, even if you want to change, if you're not able in, in, a, in a financial position to be able to invest in cleaner, in less energy intensive machines, then you're stuck just facing the higher price and using the machines you've already installed. So, so the output prices are in a way determining the, uh, the ability, are being factored into the, uh, the ability of South Africa to become more energy efficient or for industries to become more, more energy efficient. Um, on the biomass, um, we're right now at the moment, as Alison was saying, trying to fully integrate the Times Energy model with the with the economy-wide economic model, and, and that would link both the um, both the electricity and the fuel sectors together. And so it would be the energy model that predetermines for the CGE model uh, in a sort of iterative backward and forward process um, what the uh, what the different uh, key energy sources are going to be in the model. In this particular case, we locked down. In this analysis, we locked down the electricity sector, and so if that South African build plan said no electricity from biomass, for example, then we just simply stuck to whatever they, they were projecting. Um, uh, for biomass, for, for fuels, for biofuels and so on, we actually assumed that there were very few options for, for South Africa, which I think is fairly consistent with some of the policies as they stand, but not necessarily where they could go in, in the future. Um, and then on the, uh, on the external costs, and I, I shouldn't speak for Alison, but certainly from the, from the economic side of things, we didn't take pollution and some of these other uh, potential benefits from switching away from coal. Uh, we didn't include the health benefits um, in our analysis, and that would actually, um, uh, th that might uh, make a, a less coal-intensive path look more, um, more attractive. We did take the emissions from the non-electricity sector, and there's an economy-wide analysis. Every sector is included, transport, mining, and so on. Interestingly enough, and this is an argument that a lot of South African, well, we've heard that the energy-intensive industries talk about in South Africa, is that actually they argue that, yes, the coal they mine is a very dirty product, but the process of mining it in South Africa is amongst the cleanest in the world. So if someone has to mine coal, they argue it should be South Africa. Okay. <laughs> so that's a, that, 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 that's a fairly interesting argument. It's a difficult one to actually argue against. Someone has to produce aluminium, which uses lots of electricity, um, or mine coal is a better example. And then on the recycling, sorry, which was now, now that I remember, you're absolutely right. We don't take the, uh, the leakages into account. We assume that the National Treasury doesn't pocket the money, right? Uh, I think, and Constantine can, can talk to this, um, uh, the funds are not earmarked, so they're not specifically designed for programs. They just go into the pool and then they are, they are rolled out and, or intended to be rolled out as part of the general budget, and so they would be subject to the same um, uh, monitoring that would be, uh, would be afforded to other activities or existing activities. The other thing we don't take into account is the actual administrative cost of implementing the carbon tax, so that's another shortcoming in our, in our work. Did, I mean, on, no, the, no. on the pollution, of the external effects. <laughs> yeah, so, so on, the, on, the, on the emissions on, on coal production, there, there are emissions from mining um, in the model. But, but also South Africa's emissions, methane emissions from mining, are actually pretty low. I can't remember exactly why. It's something to do with there being seams in the coal and, and basically what methane is in there largely escapes before. It's, it's, there's not much to escape during the mining process. I think Philip Lloyd has a, has a good paper on methane emissions from coal mining. Um, externality costs weren't uh, included, and, and it's an interesting, because because all of this went through the scenario building team process, at some point, even though there were strong lobby groups, um, WWF, Earth Life Africa, amongst others, who were lobbying for inclusion of externality costs for some or other reason. There must have been, yeah, at some point a decision was made that they would not be included. I can't remember exactly why, but it's probably in the documentation somewhere. And, and then the same comment applies to the, the choice of the words business as usual for the, that, that's an agreed term from the scenario building team. So it's not something we came up with as, as researchers, it, it's, it's what um, industry, government, and others decided it should be called. But I totally agree that, you, you know, this is going back to Basia 2003. This research is now somewhat out of date, and yes, things have changed considerably since then, including, you know, economic growth, which has not happened as was agreed upon um, in, during the SBT meetings. Um, and, and it would be great to see this, this work being um, updated and, and repeated regularly, but uh, that is not the case. 
when you actually want to it. Uh, no. Um, just on the recycling side, I mean, we're pretty confident that if we recycle through the tax system, that will be very efficient. Uh, however, it is unlikely that uh, this is how we will be recycling, at least in the initial stages when the revenue is very small. Uh, it's also that the sales tax, which in our case is uh, mostly VAT, is very low in South Africa. It's 14%. Uh, so it is unlikely that uh, the recycling will take place through VAT. But we have indicated that there is a big chance that as the revenue increases, we will be recycling through uh, personal income tax and corporate income tax. So uh, recycling through the tax system is... I don't think that they're massive leakages. Uh, it is recycling through other um, other channels that may lead to linkages and inefficiencies. So uh, on that note, I want to thank our panel uh, for very, um, uh, very useful and interesting presentations. And I want to remind you again that uh, in the last session, we will take some of the research uh, into uh, the political economy. And we'll, we will talk also, my boss will talk rather, about uh, what we're going, uh, what we're doing going forward. So thank you very much to our panel.